Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Seth Williams and Jaron Barnes, and you're listening to the RE Tipster Podcast. Today we're talking with a friend that uh, we seem to run into at most of the real estate conferences that we attend. His name is Alex Scott Felice. What's up, boys? What's up, man? What's up? What's up? So Alex is a real estate investor and an online content creator who started buying a single family long-term rentals back in 2014. And then he moved into multifamily in 2019 and he joined Climb Capital in 2021. In Climb Capital, I'm not gonna get too much into it. We'll let Alex talk more about that. But the basic synopsis is uh, they buy multifamily apartments, RV parks, mobile home parks, and businesses through syndications. Alex is also an army veteran and a very transparent and authentic person, as you'll find. He does a great job of detailing all his deals on his website at brokeisachoice.com. Alex, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm very thankful to be here. It's good to hang out with you guys as usual. We travel in similar circles, so it's always fun to, to bump into each other. Yeah. So first question is, who does your hair? How do you get your hair to look like that? <laughs> Yeah, there's not that many coming up on 40-year-old guys who work in private equity with Mohawks, but I am rocking it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do that. I'm a little jealous of both of you guys because I lost my hair at like 22. So <laughs> Yeah, well, look, that's why I'm rocking it so hard because people are like, oh, you're going to go bald one day. I'm like, bro, this is not going anywhere. 38, there's no <laughs> chance. And so like, I'm just shoving it in everybody's face for all the guys who are like Jaron, who just... If you had it, you'd flaunt it. So I'm doing it for you. You can live vicariously. I appreciate me. that, man. You need to get some dreads for me because I've always wanted dreads. And I was literally considering inches away from considering it. And then my hair started thinning out. But look, real talk. Real serious, serious talk. Serious talk. Round brush, blow dry. Make sure it's completely dry. Heat and tension. About five minutes in the morning. A little bit of pomade. You are good. What kind of product are you using? Where are you getting your pomade? <laughs> I get some stuff off of Amazon. <laughs> It's like, I got a source that I, I will not tell specifics. anybody about. I buy it in bulk because I'm afraid they're going to stop making it one day. So I buy it by, by, by the 10 pack. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's awesome. Alex, I'm really curious. I know we're about to get into a bunch of real estate stuff, but I saw doing some digging in preparation of the show that you got an undergrad in finance and you have spent time in the military and have other very interesting things in your background. But you also have this like anti-fragile, like interesting life philosophy. I'll put it that way. And I'm just curious, like jumping off into our conversation, how do you go from somebody who's like military and kind of like school and in the box to somebody who's so out of the box? Because to be honest, out of everybody that I have met in the real estate space, there's you and then this guy named LB Stoffer that just stand out as like just different. Like they just are somebody who operates at a different wavelength and it's really attractive and really appealing. You're just at a different radar. So how did you go from like being in the box to like out of the box? That's a really hard question. I've always felt a misfit, an outcast. You know, I was listening to angsty music as a kid and I think most people grow out of that. The army tried to beat it out of me and, and they couldn't. So I went to school for finance because I want to learn about money and I went to work in a banking and they couldn't beat it out of me either. And so what I learned along the way, I guess, is I've always been very contrarian. I've always been very like, hey, whatever everybody else is doing is popular. I don't want to do it. In fact, I don't care if it's even a good idea. If it's popular, I'm just, I reject it. I'm trying to give you like the short answer. So along the way, in fact, it's so uh, interesting. I posted today on my Instagram, three books that if you want to reject societal norms and become a hyper individualist. One of them is um, Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra. One of them is actually a book I'm wearing. I have t-shirts that have books written on them. One of them is Don Quixote. And another one is Letters to a Young Contrarian. I think it's very easy to go along with what's normal. I think it's very easy to go along with being a high appease person. Like, hey, I'm just going to do what I think people will like me if I do. And I just don't, I reject all that. And I don't care if people really don't. I'm not after making everybody like me. In fact, I'm kind of like of the opinion where, you know, it's like politics. It's like, I'm not really trying to get 80%. I'm trying to piss the other 49% so I can get just my <laughs> correct 51. I'm not looking to make everybody happy. I'm just looking to make the people that are right for me really happy. And that really comes from being, I believe, what I call hyper-individualist. So, But how do you find the courage to do it? Because you like, read those books, bro. I'm probably like you, like in terms of like my natural, like I've always been kind of a free thinker and kind of forged my own path. But 
man, I'll tell you what, like you get in the trenches of life, you get older in age and it becomes easier and easier and easier to just go with the status quo. Yeah. Like the older you get, it's almost like, I mean, you, you're rocking a mohawk, bro. And you said you were like, what, how did you say you were? 38. Come on, man. 38. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's so inspiring to me. <laughs> you know, like, look at your shoes. Like, like, it's so epic, right? Can we dive into the mindset stuff a little bit on the, the confidence side of that? Because it takes a lot of courage to yeah. just stick to your guns and be who you are, despite so much pressure for you to like fit a particular mold, you know? I have one quick question. What if the norm became the way that Alex is? What if everybody else started up wearing sporting mohawks? Would you That's then not question. have a mohawk just to be different? Yeah, I'd shave it. Okay. I'd shave it in That's... a cocaine heartbeat. Wow. <laughs> that makes me think that the mohawk isn't really who Alex is. He's just trying to get away from the norm. So in a way, you're almost like the opposite of selling out. Like you're doing the opposite of people just to be different, right? Yeah, well, I think what Jaren's asking is how do you become an individual? How do you become highly individual? I think if I could sum it up like really broad, I'd say, you know, confidence comes from always being outside of your comfort zone, right? So go wear pink t-shirts for a month and like see how it feels. You get used to it. And then other people know you as the guy who wears pink t-shirts and you're like, oh, I can do it. I just had to do it. So some of it yeah. is coming out of your comfort zone. It costs nothing to wear pink t-shirts or pink shoes. There's no risk. Some of it is always being outside of your comfort zone. Some of it is community. Like if you hang out with people who sort of dislike you going outside of the norm, then you're going to have to go against the grain. And that just makes it harder. You want to be around people who support your individuality. Even like nobody would describe me as nice. Nobody thinks of me as like a super nice guy. What they say is Alex will tell you the real truth, even though you don't want to hear it sometimes. And so people value my individuality or my specific personality for its ups and downs. And the third one is content. If you consume content, it's like anything else. If you consume all one types of content, you become that, that thing. And so I consume content by people who are contrarian and they, they will tell you how to be a contrarian. And so the, some of the books I listed today, and I'll give you a, I can give you a laundry list of other books from thinkers, philosophers, some alive, most dead people who have said, everybody in the whole world is wrong except me. And I'll show you how to do it. So yeah, I'm happy to have that conversation. I appreciate the sentiment because I don't think of myself as, I don't always think about it as a benefit. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm the outcast. Like the norm is sometimes appealing. Yeah, it is appealing, especially the older you get. It becomes easy, like going against the grain and being a free thinker and like having contrary thoughts to what's most popular is it's extremely courageous. And that's something that really was the crux of my question is like, how do I develop or sustain the confidence to encourage when like you're in a situation where you have... I don't know, like people have a lot of like they'll get married and they'll have kids and they'll have to be like, you know, I can't go be a rock star right now because I have to like, like feed mouths. Right. But can you sustain being a rock star and still feed mouths? You know, like, can you do both? Or like, how do you continue to stay true to who you are when like so much around you is like, you need to be this way, you know, because the whole world is telling all of us all the time that you have to be a certain way. First off, I don't have kids. So maybe that Maybe that helps. Secondly, I am deeply, like deeply entrenched in my soul that I think most people are idiots. So I have no interest in being like them. Not to say people as individuals, like I know you guys, I don't mean it as like a personal insult to anybody. I just mean like in mass people, I don't want to be like them. I don't want it. Hmm. And so I can't convince myself to do it. As I get older, I want to become more individualistic, not less. I'll tell you what, it, it's harder to get paid as a hyper individual. It's easier to get paid if you fit the norms. Like I'm trying to you know, raise money for big projects. And it's like, people don't want to, it's harder to go get somebody who, you know, I look like a risk. I look like a liability or, you know, it's the unknown. If you make it big as a rock star or an artist, then people are like, oh my God, we always knew. But going against the grain sometimes is like, is this guy for real or is he just a lunatic? So there's definitely comes with downsides and I'm mostly okay with those downsides, especially now that I have a little bit of money that's on my terms where I'm like, you know what? You really can't cancel me or fire me now. So it emboldens me to do more. But I'll say this, dude, to sum it up, like, try. Go find something that's out of your comfort zone that's low risk, which a lot, write something that you think that isn't, you know, content for a marketing purpose. Write something that you think about the world and post it. Wear something. Or yeah, I picked up that camera. You know, I do, a lot of, I do a lot of photography now. And it's like, go do something that people don't expect of you that you want to do and just say, okay, I'll do a little bit. I don't have to be a different Jaren today, but I can be a little bit different, right? You're only, I don't know how old you are, but you're going to live to about 100. 30. You're 30, Jesus. Yeah. So, dude, you're you're gonna you got 70 more years. Like, don't get in the box yet. 
right? Don't get in that box yet. There's a lot of time to, to be you. I wonder if, it, if it's a less stressful way to live when you are a contrarian or when you don't feel the need to fit into societal norms. Because I can see it going both ways. On one hand, like you don't have to care if you don't look the right way. But on the other hand, it's almost like, I don't know, like, do you feel the need to go out of your way to be different? Or you just the cards kind of just fall where they do. And that's just kind of how you live life. No, I get nervous about stuff all the time because it's incorrect. It's false to say you don't care what other people think because it's a balance, right? I'm not trying to appease people, but also I want to be, you know, I'm a smart guy and I'm, I'm doing real estate. I'm, I have investors and I have responsibilities and I want to be taken seriously. So I definitely have to walk that balance of like, I am going to live on my terms, but I can't go off and just go scorched earth either. So it's definitely a balance and you have to earn respect along the way. And so somebody sees my mohawk and they're like, yeah, but you know, I pay out $100,000 last year in investor returns and profits just in cash flow. I very much think about it in the kind of the difference between like action and words where it's like, I don't care if you really don't like the way I look or dress, that's okay. But listen to what I'm telling you. My ideas and my actions speak for themselves more than the theatrics, I guess. So a lot of it is some of it is theatrics. Some of it's like, you know, the Mohawk, it's theatrics. Like it's not, I really don't care about the hair. It's a big game, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big show. But, you know, the books that I choose to consume, I think that says, I think the books that you choose to consume says a lot about you. So that's an easy way, Jaren, for you to be like, okay, I want to go against the grain. Let me learn from the people who came before me. And that costs nothing to go learn from like Chris Hitchens, like I said, is a great one, um, Letters to a Young Contrarian. And he, he has this exact problem. And his is more about politics and religion, where he's like, hey, I have these ideas that don't go along with my family, my community, or, you know, where I live. And he's like, okay, well, don't give your ideas up just because the people who are around you don't agree with them. Here's how you stick to your guns. Those ideas translate. I mean, pink t-shirts and tricky shoes and mohawks are, like I said, those are theatrics. But, you know, anti-fragility as an idea or reading philosophy, these are, these are serious, serious ways to develop an individual and a set of values and not the norm. And they're things I take very seriously. And so, but it takes you nothing to go read a book. You know, something that comes to mind that I thought was really interesting, and it's really interesting that you're actually on the show while we're talking about this, because this happened at the best ever conference that we hung out at. Do you remember? I'll be, I'm going tomorrow. You bailed on me. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't able to make it this year. But what was interesting about going to best ever is like in the multifamily space, even though best ever is kind of more of a more approachable brand, you still are hanging out with a bunch of people in suits that have a very specific culture, a very specific mold that you're supposed to meet. And I felt like all of the people that we were hanging out with were like the outcasts or like the people that did not fit that mold. And we were all hanging out and having a great time. But something that happened to me on that trip, a friend of mine who lives in Colorado, who also went to the conference there, you know, I thought that I was dressed pretty decently. Like I had a blazer on and I had like flat brim hat and I was trying to look in the way that I dress pretty decent because I knew that it was a pretty professional environment. Right. And I asked my friend in all truth, like I was like, Hey, cause we started talking about people's dress and stuff. And I said, how do you feel about the way that I'm dressed? You feel like I'm dressed appropriately. And his comment was, well, you look really relaxed. I'll put it that way, right? <laughs> Which was kind of like a very backhanded way of saying you don't look like you're dressed to the par. And I started really thinking about that. That that was probably one of the biggest takeaways from the entire conference for me because I started thinking about, hmm, well, what if I was Gary Vaynerchuk and I had this huge brand and this huge following and everybody was eating out of my hands? Would they care if I was wearing like a hip hop urban style hat? Would they care? Would they care if I showed up in pajamas? And the answer is probably not. That's why Gary Vanisher can like go around and be an individualist who wears like sock hats and jeans and everybody wants to invest in them. Everybody wants to eat out of his hands because he got results. His predictions of the market and things that were, were going to happen from years and years ago, his track record of predicting merges and trends is huge. So people, despite what he wears and how he carries himself and the fact that he cusses like a sailor and whatever, like none of that derails him. None of that has any negative impact on his influence because his results precede him, right? That's how I, I realized, okay, 
I'm going to just double down. I'm going to be really quiet. I'm going to stay in my corner and I'm going to get some ridiculous results. And then once I have the results, everybody's going to be wanting to eat out of my hand and they're going to love me for who I am. And it's going to be great. And I don't have to pretend to be anything special or different or fit any kind of mold. I can just be truly a, an individualist, right? And I think that's what you're kind of getting at is like, if you can make it as a rock star, right? If you can get the results, then it really doesn't matter. You can, as long as you just don't show up naked and you'll be all right. In 2008, a bunch of bankers and investors got together and they made some of the worst risk decisions that economics has ever seen. And they collapsed the world economy pretty significantly, probably the worst that we'll see in our lifetimes. And they were wearing the nicest suits that money can buy. Hmm. So yeah. you can't tell me that a suit means that you know what you're doing. You can't tell me. I've seen it fail. I've seen it be wrong. I mean, they collapsed it to an unbelievable degree, right? And it was just irresponsibility. It was irresponsibility and just human, regular human. I don't want to say greed because it necessarily wasn't greed, but it was just, you know, short-sightedness, right? I don't think short-sighted. I think very long-sighted. I never play the two-year game. I always play the 40-year game. And so I just don't care about, you know, somebody who's going to look at me and say, oh, that idiot with a pink t-shirt or pink shoes or whatever, like, I'm not going to talk to him. It's like, you know what? I'm going to see you every year because I don't go away. And so we're going to be friends whether you like it or not. You don't know it yet, right? We're going to be friends. And the other thing is, you know, those guys, not, a lot of those people, that, that thing, they're stuffy. Like, they got their insecurities too. They have their insecurities they too. They have a lot of insecurities. A lot of them are yeah. flaunting and frauds, right? I don't mean frauds like economic fraud. I mean, like, they're individual frauds, right? They don't know who they are. They don't know what they've accomplished. Maybe they got lucky. Maybe they walked into something and they're spending money on suits to try to convince you of the opposite that I'm trying to convince you of. They're like, hmm. I'm cool. I'm normal. I'm responsible. Please trust me. Here's my suit. And I'm like, I don't care what you think about me. Wait till we have a conversation. You'll find out I'm the real deal. Yeah. Drop the mic moment right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> what I hate though, Jaron, I hate that that guy got in your head. Don't let that happen. No, it was good. You didn't ask me and say, Alex, am I cool? I'd be like, you're cool. Go be you. You were, in fact, let's have that conversation then, right? I watch you. You're walking around with the mic. I can't do that. I cannot record my face in public. It makes me so insecure. So you're walking around doing YouTube. And I'm like, that guy's got confidence. And let me tell you something, dude. I don't care about money. Confidence is the most valuable asset that a human being can have. More than time, I think, even. I a thousand percent agree with that. The two biggest things I've ever done to help self-develop like my skill set for the marketplace was open air preaching and door knocking. When I first got started in real estate, I literally quit my stable job that I could convince the guy to hire me with no college degree and insurance of all things. And I, a month later, I walked out and I started door knocking. And I door knocked for, I think, a year and a half, two years. I was door knocking pre-foreclosures. And that amount of consistent rejection, rejection, like you have to find something in yourself when you face that amount of rejection where you like yourself no matter what. And that's something that recently has been a, a big kind of revelation for me is like, I got to be my number one fan. People are fickle. They're going to like me when they ha can get something from me at the end of the day. Like that's the, that's how human society works, right? That's not true. I disagree. Well, I don't know. I think, it, again, it goes back to results. Like if you can provide what people want, they're going to instantly like you despite what you wear, what you listen to. I think it's more like if you can provide value. I don't know if it's you can do something. If you can provide value to somebody and you can make their life a Fair little enough. better. That's what I mean by results. Yeah. That, yeah. For which sure. you should do. You should try yeah. to make people's lives better. I agree. That you should be a giver. And I do want to just mention one thought about this whole idea that confidence is the number one asset a person can have. I think that's true to a point. But when you think about where does confidence come from? I think it usually comes from one of two places. Is it either comes from experience and preparation and knowing what you're doing, or it comes from ignorance and not knowing what you're doing. Or arrogance. I know a lot of people who have been very confident and very stupid at the same time. And the thing is, like, a person who knows no better and just sees confidence, they see the confidence figure, well, they must be right because they're confident, right? But they're actually leading people astray and kind of like stirring up trouble for themselves in the future because their confidence is coming from the wrong place. It's not coming from a healthy place of experience and actual knowledge. It's more of just, I'm a confident person inherently, whether I know what I'm talking about or not. So I, I think being confident is a huge asset for that one person. Maybe not for the rest of the world though, or maybe not for themselves eventually if they steer themselves and other people the wrong way. Just a thought though. 
neuroticism is a measurable human trait. You can measure it. Some people are score really low in neuroticism. They don't get affected by negative emotions. They don't get affected by the the dwelling like Jaron and I are obviously doing about like who I am, how am I portrayed, how these social interactions go. If you have a really low neuroticism, low shame, then yeah, confidence, you turn into uh, charlatans and con men. But if you have, a, if you're a normal person, you feel shame and then you can have some confidence. I think you're deadly, but it's hard. I do think though that there is a certain level of audacious self-love that you have to have in order to be successful that's like to think that you can have something of value for somebody inherently is extremely radical and arrogant i don't think that you can get around that to think that you can be successful to think that you can come from not being a millionaire to becoming a millionaire like you actually believe that at your core that's extremely arrogant to think but then when you go and do it all of a sudden you're no longer arrogant, you're inspiring and confident, right? Like we change it, but it's a large portion when you're in the trenches, it's like, you know what? I don't care if my wife doesn't believe in me. I don't care if my friends don't believe me. I don't care if nobody believes in me. I can freaking do it because I'm epic. I'm awesome, right? You have to have a little bit of that. That's what I was talking about earlier with the Mohawks, right? It's like, oh, you guys don't think Mohawks are cool? You're everyone's wrong but me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely a balance. There's a balance between like having that confidence to know you're right, even though everybody in the world is wrong or having an idea that hasn't been done yet. And then also, you know, I dwell in a lot of self-loathing too. So people are complicated. People are not one way. People are good days and bad days. Multifaceted for sure. So real estate. (laughs) When and why did real estate come into the picture? Yeah. So I get out of the army and I was like, dude, I'm sick of this kind of to this thing, right? I'm sick of this box. I don't like being in this box. It's too regimented for me. I did two tours in Afghanistan. So a little of that goes a long way. And so I was like, okay, let me get out of this thing. And I got out and I really didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't really have any skills. And so I kind of just putted around. I sold some cars, which in retrospect was very valuable because to your point earlier, Jaron, about like rejection is so, it's so good. So helpful. And be able to earn people's trust in a short amount of time, build rapid rapport, you know, learn how to get, make people like you, even though, you know, they walk up in the car dealership and they're like, first off, I hate you. And then an hour and a half, they're like, Alex, I love you. And I'm like, I still got that baby. Right. So, (laughs) (laughs) but the car business, man, that's a tough racket. And so I was like, okay, I got to get out of this. I sort of went to school in Arizona, learned how to build some houses with my uncle and, and put around, spent a little more time in the car business. And I had to get out. And I had to get out in a way I was like, okay, this money problem, this like live in month to month, I was always terrible with money. I was always terrible with money. And so I was like, this money problem, I've got to fix this money problem forever. Not just like make more money because people think they got to make more money. And that is not really, most of the time people who make more money, they just end up pissing more money away. Like the key is not to make more money. The key is to utilize the money you have as, as maximally efficient as possible. I didn't know that at the time. But I was like, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to school because I have this GI Bill. I'm gonna go to college. I'm gonna get a degree in finance because my thinking was if I learn about money, then I can either make more or manage my money better. Now, in retrospect, that's not really going to get a finance degree. You don't need, I need to listen to podcasts and learn personal finance is what I really needed. I didn't need to go to a degree, but that was my thinking, right? My thinking was, let me be consumed with this and I'll beat it. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm going to school. And like, I have a 45 minute commute three times a week each way. And so I'm like, I listen to podcasts and I listen to the richest man in Babylon. And that like pinged my soul about like, oh my God, spend less than you earn. Who knew? Who knew this, this secret, (laughs) right? And, uh, (laughs) and so it was like, I'm dude, I'm like 30, right? I'm 30 and broke and I'm just figuring this stuff out. So I'm not like a lifelong success. I'm mostly like a lifelong train wreck. I was basically an alcoholic at the time. And I was like, okay, I'm going to clean all this up, right? I got my degree. I started working in banking as like a regular retail open in bank accounts, $40,000 a year, you know, just in a small town, nothing special. But what it did was it gave me a W-2 so I could go off and buy real estate. I was listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast as I was traveling in 2013. I go look on the, mar- on the market. I'm like, dude, there's foreclosures everywhere. I didn't know at the time, real estate, you know, 13, 14, people were still scared about the economy. Nowadays, they don't even, they don't even know what that feels like. They're like, oh, things only go up. I wish I could go back <laughs> to those days, man. Yeah. So you go on the market. I'm like, there's houses. There's 10 houses on the market for 30 grand each. I can go buy one of these and make some money. So saved money like gangbusters, lived light, uh, bought a foreclosure in 2014, moved in it with like three grand, right? Fix it up a little bit myself because my uncle taught me how to do some rehabs and put some sweat equity into it. And like a year later, we went and got an appraised because I was going to take a bigger loan out on it and it appraised for like 115. And I think I had, I don't know, 60 in it, 55 in it. And I was like, bro, I went from broke my whole life to doing real estate for a year and I made 70 grand or something. 
this is so easy. Real estate is easy. Real estate is the easiest thing I've ever done. And so I was like, let's just do this forever. This is going to work. It took me a little while. In 16, I bought a home. In 17, I moved to Las Vegas. I ended up buying three homes long distance uh, in the same market. In 2018, I bought two homes. And by that time, I'd been doing it a few years. I had started my blog. Like I went from a train wreck with no idea what to do to like, I found, dude, audiobooks. Once I found the audiobooks and I found kind of communities that were that were like-minded, that wanted to grow. Once I like kind of had that Phoenix moment, and I was like, okay, I'm sick of being an alcoholic who's living for the weekend, broke all the time, spending money on booze and clothes. I'm going to go hyper-dedicated, hyper-responsibility, right? I'm going to play for, for my future. But everything changed once I just started taking it seriously. And it's like, I, and I played the long game. And so I'm not a hyper-entrepreneur. I didn't go super hard. I was buying a couple of single-family homes here and there, saving a little bit of cash. I'm not rich, but it was working. And then in 2019, the market for single families was getting busy. So I was like, okay, we got to move on to this next thing. That's when I started to feel it. I'm like, look, I thought I could buy real estate. My whole plan was to buy 10 houses in 10 years. That was the goal. I ended up buying eight houses in three years. So I was like, okay, maybe I'm capable of more than I had thought. I didn't think I could go to college. I did that. I didn't think I could buy a house. I definitely did that. I didn't think I could join the army or jump out of airplanes. Like all the things I didn't think I could do, I did. So then instead of this time for the first time in my life at 36, I was like, okay, I can buy a multifamily property. I can do it. I know I can do it. So in 2019, I did it long distance. I raised $280,000 from investors from my website. We bought a 24 unit for a million bucks in Fayetteville. And then in 2022, I bought a 52 unit for 3.2 million. We raised 1.4 million in cash from investors from my website. And we are crushing projections. And then that led me to a couple of partners who are, you know, I did two deals. They had done 20 and they're like, look, you know, you have $5 million in assets under management. We have 50 million. We need more people on our team. You don't want to build a team from scratch. You just want to do your piece, which I did. I just wanted to do my piece and they do their piece. Join our team. You know, we'll make you a partner and we'll all do it together. And you can kind of just do what you're good at, which is being loud on the internet, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm at work. <laughs> and so we'll see how it goes. It's only been a few months, but hopefully that's going to work out. I love it, man. Yeah. Well, I have a good segue question there. Like, so what are you doing exactly right now in this crazy market to get deals? Because I literally, on my way into the shared workspace that I'm working out of right now, had a conversation with a wholesaler friend of mine who's like, there's no deals. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, I, <laughs> like my business model is not working anymore. So what are you doing? First off, uh, most people, a lot of people are struggling right now and they won't say it. If you go on the internet, everybody's winning. Don't believe them. They're all lies. It's all fraud. We are in peak mania. I mean, you can look at the stock market. It's 28, 30x earnings, right? Houses are going for more than they're asking for. It's insane, right? Yeah, it is. It's mania. It's not economics. It's mania. And people are so convinced that the future is going to be better than the past, even though there's big risks coming up. So what am I doing? We have pivoted. I think C, we were buying C-class multifamily. I think those are going to be um, crunched more than others as the rates come up. I think the pivot that people should be making is A-class, A-class real estate in appreciating markets. That's the play because things are going to appreciate. Or what we've decided to do, some people are going D-class, right? They're going to mobile home parks, uh, but those tenants, they're tough. And I don't, want, I don't want a deal. Those are the two kind of pivots because the economy is going to diverge, right? You're going to have, you're going to have an inequality problem growing. So the third option that we are doing is we're kind of doing a hybrid where we're going off and we're buying RV parks. We're buying mom and pop RV parks and we are upfitting them with pools and we're making them destination resort RV parks for A-class tenants to come in and we own the dirt. And because it's a fragmented market, like, like multifamily, C-class multifamily was eight years ago, it's, it's fragmented. The syndicators haven't gotten their hands on it yet. You can still go and, and cold call and get those leads. And we have experience, right? Because it's a multifaceted business model. It's like, it is hospitality, right? It is an aspect of hospitality. We also started doing this thing where we're buying manufactured tiny homes on wheels so we can depreciate them 100% and we stick them on the plots and we rent them out as Airbnb. So we got to, it's not, I say real estate is easy. That's been my catchphrase. You guys have probably heard me say it a million times. Real estate is so easy and it has been easy for the last six years. And let me tell you something right now, real estate, not so easy. The margins are down. You got to work way harder. You got to be way more creative all that to make less money. So the real play right now is to be highly, highly, highly strategic. Do not over leverage. And then most of all, be patient because everything goes in a cycle. If you're trying to get rich right now, it's the hardest time. I'm trying to get rich over 40 years. I don't care that we're in a top part of the market cycle. I'm not playing for this year. I'm playing for 40 years. With these RV parks, just to clarify what that means. So this is like uh, parceled out, like there's cement slabs, electricity, utilities are there. 
Like it's currently operating that way. You're not making changes, you're just buying it as it is. And are you changing something to make them operate better? Or The big thing we're trying to do is we're trying to buy places that have land so we can add. And then we're adding amenities, right? So we're adding, the big one is pools. I don't know why. I'm still a little bit new to it, to be honest. If you add a pool to an RV park, people flock to it. It's like a weird, Yeah. I, I shouldn't say it that way, but you, it, it, what it does is it's, if you add amenities, people are traveling more, right? This yeah. you know, van life is, is coming. That is not a trend. Yeah. That's coming. I can see that. And so people are coming. They're like, okay, well, I, I came to Orlando and I got this place or I came to Pensacola and you know, now what? It's like, well, the drive was fun, but now that I'm at this place, there's a tennis court or a pool. And so I can do some of the stuff here. Yeah. Sort of has something to offer, right? It's not just some like parcel land in the middle of nowhere. There's like something. It's to not do just a dirt pad. There. It's it's yeah. hooked up. It's hooked up with electricity, right? We have we're building like guest game rooms or you know like the family the the buildings mm -hmm. for rent, pools, amenities. We're making a, a resort RV parks, and some of them, bro, some of them are ridiculous. Some of them have water parks, like mini golf. Some of them have real sick amenities. Mm -hmm. You attract a higher end customer. You can ask a little bit more money. You provide a great service, and at the end of the day, we own the land. I don't have to worry about the building i don't have to worry about you know maintenance on there's very low maintenance so yeah it is an underserved and growing asset class i hate to be sleazy on your show but if you do want to invest with me you can you just gotta you know, come find me <laughs> we are taking partners but um it's a growing asset class it's one that a lot of the bigger companies haven't moved to yet it's still fragmented and you know the numbers for rv parks were the rv park industry had a record year last year i think this is going to going to continue Remote work, we always knew remote work was going to come. And now, like after COVID, it's it's coming fast. So yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of management is needed at an RV park? Like, is there a property manager living on site or what? So right now we're buying like 100 pad parks. And, you know, ideally we'd find a 100 pad park and add 50 pads, something like that. A lot of man-made lakes too, which is interesting. People can fish and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Management, so Klein Capital has its a subsidiary that is its own management company. You don't need somebody on site, but you do need somebody who understands the demo, the, you know, what people are going to need. A lot of it's like just making sure the amenities are straight. These are people who have packed up their whole lives and their family and gotten in a vehicle and driven cross country. Like they have a level of self-reliance and self-independence that they're gonna, not going to need so much babysitting. My C-class apartment building, the community that I love and I love that property and I love that asset class, but like they need me to fix. It's like, oh, my light bulb went out. Mm -hmm. It's not really my responsibility, but like also I have to do it. I had to hire a couple of kids to come out there and clean up trash full time because people would take trash. They're just leaving it on the ground. Like there's trash bins and stuff for them to place it. And they just will just on the ground. And I'm like, you guys live here. I don't live here. Those people need to be babysat. I'm sorry to say the mm -hmm. RV park people, they do not need to be babysat. So there is, you do need management because there's problems on site and there's uh, maintenance for the amenities and stuff, but it's, it's much less. Yeah. So uh, what do you do with management though? Like, so are you actually training your own property manager? Are there like specific RV park management companies? Because I know a lot of people in the syndication space, that's one of the reasons why most syndicators will go after large units because they can get good quality management. Whereas, you know, lower like 10 unit, 15 unit kind of stuff is harder to get management. But I, maybe you're leveraging your experience of having an eight unit and some other properties but what how are you like finding them because i don't i don't know i can look up online like a rv park manager but maybe i'm wrong so to be completely clear this is all done before i joined climb they had the same problem i did and the same problem you alluded to which is you know the 24 unit it was hard because it's like you got to get basically one person it's not cost effective enough for one person to co-manage that especially when it's a you know a c minus class property it's a tough property and so it's just not cost effective for managers so i ended up doing well on that property and i exited it and then what about the 52 unit, it was a little bit more like, hey, look, this is one person's job, but now it's a little bit more lucrative for them. And so the guys at Climb had the same problem. And they're like, okay, we're going to stop trying to hire these people because we're buying RV parks around the Sunbelt. It's not just like they're on one city. And so instead of trying to find five different management companies and finding the, like, the one right person for each of these properties, they just started bringing it in-house. So I don't really deal with that side of it, to be completely honest. But the gist is, yeah, we're, you bring people in and they have to do a little bit of traveling. But most of those places, they you don't need to be there every day. Mm -hmm. Like you would for a hundred unit where it's like there's something like the toilet's always broken, right? Or a light bulb always needs to be replaced or somebody always monkeyed something up. It doesn't need day to day. So the management is very much top down inside of Climb Capital or it's called Altitude Property Management. But yeah, for the most part, they're fairly low maintenance that we can do it in-house and not have to. And, and we kind of solved that problem. Now, I think once things get bigger, there's always problems of scale. But if we went off and we bought a two or three, 400 pad park or, or more than one of them and, and we will. 
you know, we'll have to adapt to that new, those new challenges. But for the time being, it doesn't take that much for these, you know, hundred pads isn't like hundred unit apartment building because it's not a hundred people living there every day. It's people coming and going, you know, a lot of them short term. I think only 25% of them are long-term tenants. The rest of them are all short. They're all, they come in, they park for a few nights and they bail. So what do you need, right? You got to make sure the Wi-Fi, the water and the electricity runs. And those things aren't things that break every day. You know, the guest rooms, the, the game houses and pools, they just don't require an immense amount of upkeep. Yeah. Interesting. How do you go about finding those? Like, is this a direct mail thing? Or are you just Googling RV parks or is this like a campground essentially? Is that what this is? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. A lot of them are campground. Like we're, we, we're trying to buy some of the COA campgrounds we're buying. So the interesting thing is it's a fragmented industry. It's a super fragmented industry. So it's not like. If you had a big paycheck, you could go buy all of, you know, Joe Fairless's stuff in one. He had, it's all in, under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying he'd sell it to you, but the idea is like it's already kind of organized. Yeah, right. One guy already owns it all. But with RVs, it's like I think the majority ownership is like is like one park and a cup and a small percentage own two or three. There's nobody who owns 100. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the industry is just hasn't been. It's just so fragmented because it was never it was just easier to go off and buy an apartment building because they're a little bit more tried and true. Whereas this is, it takes a little bit of tenacity. It takes a little bit of like, okay, it's a more complicated business model. Apartments are easy. Rent minus all fixed costs, net cash flow, you're done. This thing, it's like, okay, we have hospitality expenses, right? We have, we're going to have a much higher vacancy because we have short-term tenants. So it's a different business model. It takes a little bit more um, tenacity, a little bit more creativity. And so people haven't really moved in on it yet. We are moving in on it fast. I think we own six now and we just exited one. And we got 20 million in LOI out for a few more. But yeah, some of it's cold calling, some of it's relationships, right? Because there's not that many people going gangbusters on RV parks and we put our name out there. Look, I'm doing it right now, right? If, you got, if you're a broker and you got an RV park for sale, call me, right? Especially if it's in the South, if it's in the Southeast, like call me, right? I'm, and so the more people that know us as RV park buyers, we, the brokers start calling us. Hey, so-and-so has his RV park, doesn't know what to do with it, wants to get rid of it. None of my people want to buy it. You guys are RV park people. Can we make a deal? Yeah, we sure can. So a lot of it is relationships. Some of it is cold, is uh, off-market campaigns, which again, like Jaron said earlier, like the wholesalers are having a hard time because it's saturated. I get five to 10 phone calls a day. I get texts, right? I don't know how many phone calls I get because I stopped answering my phone a year ago. Would you like to sell your property? Would you like to sell that property at such and such address? No, I don't want to sell any of it. My phone stays on silent. I never answer it anymore, yeah. right? <laughs> Because the wholesalers are just, they're insane, but the wholesalers haven't really moved into the RV park space yet. And, and they can't because there's not that many buyers yet. So I feel like we're really, really ahead of an industry that's it's, what's going to happen to the RV park industry over the next eight years. It's what happened to the C-class multifamily over the, la the previous eight years. And we are ahead of the game is my prediction. Yeah. It sounds similar to self storage too. So yeah, same, same. Yeah. It's a little bit more complicated business model. So it's not as appealing out of the gate, but I'm saying how it used to be in self storage. Nowadays, it's it's very competitive. But Seth will be the first to tell you he's gone pretty hard after a year. Seth is like actively doing a develop from the ground up on um, self storage. Trying to, yeah. Looking into it, it was sad because everybody touted around that it was like fragmented and similar, sounded very similar to the land space, but it's not not these days. So it sounds like you found something that was like what self-storage was or what C-class multifamily was back in the day. It's a little bit more complicated of a business model. So it's not all fixed costs. And that's what I love about real estate in general, right? It's like income, fixed costs, net cash flow. You're done. This is a little bit more complicated than that, but certainly nothing that we can't handle. It's not that complicated. It's just, it's like short-term rentals. You got a little bit more of a, a volatility aspect, but nothing that warrants uh, much concern. And then it provides much higher returns. Yeah. I wonder what it takes to like do one of these things from scratch, like find the location. I assume you'd want to do this near a place of interest, like a national park or water or something like that. And then like how complicated it is to level out the land and put a bunch of cement pads everywhere. Like if it's not worth that, I can see how it wouldn't be, but I guess I, I don't know anything about it in terms of like costs and how complicated it is. And have you guys ever looked into that or is it only existing ones? I think I don't want to say things that I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've talked, we've talked a little bit about development, but right now we are putting in so many offers on deals that make money and make sense to us. I mean, not all of them, obviously, uh, but we are putting a lot of offers in on existing parks. And so I'm sort of of the opinion, again, long game, right? Like I don't want to go and look at things and be like, oh, there's no opportunity or it's hard. So let me go and, and do this even harder thing 
to try to solve a problem that it's like, we're getting deals. We're going to buy $65 million of RV parks this year. I don't need to go learn to do something new just yet. Every time we do these parks, we do a little bit of development. So every time we get a little bit better at learning how to, you know, eventually it'll come to the point where it's like, we can make one of our own. Yeah. You know, we can, we can do that. It seems like a winning strategy, honestly, because like it's there, you know, it's working on some level. It's not a complete gamble. Whereas when you're doing something from scratch, like you have no data to go by other than like, I think this will work. But, you know, when there's an existing park you can add on to, it's, it just seems like a much more educated uh, step forward. Yeah. I mean, again, despite the mohawk and pink shoes, I'm not a high risk guy. Actually, I'm a very low risk. I'm a very conservative investor because I don't care about making money now. I care about making money forever. What's Buffett? First rule of investing, don't lose money. What's the second rule of investing? Don't lose money. So I just don't do things where I'm like, oh, this might work. I just don't do it. And especially I have investors and like, dude, there's nothing I take more seriously. I don't have kids. So like my investors are my number one responsibility in life, basically. Preserving their capital and making their money is, I take it deadly seriously. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, right. Going on doing development when it's like, okay, sure, if I have to, or when I feel confident that I can do it or that I know it's going to be a slam dunk, but taking an unnecessary risk when there's ways to make money, low risk doesn't track for me. Yeah, I love it. I am curious as we kind of need the end here. I know we have a few questions we're going to ask at the very end, but just switching gears a little bit in terms of content creation. So I know you make really solid videos and blog content. And it sounds like you decided to do that. I think you said 2018 or something like that. But I'm just curious, like, we all have different reasons for doing this. The handful of us who are content creators. What was your reason? Why? Because I know it takes a ton of time, ton of effort to make quality content like that. Like, what was your angle? Why did you decide to start doing that? Real estate changed my life. And I learned it all for free. You know, I went on the internet and somebody else had written a thing and said, here's how you buy profitable real estate and it can change your life. And then it did. And so it was like 2017, I had three houses and I was like, I'm going to buy a bunch more. I should start telling my story now because I might be able to change somebody else's life. And so since that time, I put every deal that I've ever done on my website in unbelievable thorough, like you wouldn't even, I doubt anybody's read them all, right? I think I have like 9,000 words on my 24 unit purchase first year and then sale right? I don't sell anything on my blog, no courses, no coaching, no nothing. I do free Zoom chats with people. I've been incredibly lucky and thankful and the internet has made me, given me a lot of opportunity, let me capitalize on opportunity. And it's given me essentially my freedom. I mean, I have a job because I want one, not because I need one. Not to say I'm rich. You know, I'm thankful that I live light, but I got all that and I didn't pay anybody for any of it. And they gave, they put it all out there for free. And so I just thought, man, I, would be a jerk if I turned around and charged people for the same information. So I don't really like to teach people things because kind of Jaron was saying earlier about like, you know, what we talking about, I think before the show, it's like, what do I know? Right. What do I really know? Mm -hmm. I know this is what I did. I can tell you what I did. And I can tell you the results. I don't know if I'm right. I'll just tell you what I did. So everything on my website is like, look, this is what I did. This is why I did it. And if it can help you have it. And if, it, if you think I'm an idiot, then keep it moving. Yeah. So blog broke as a choice. I do a lot of YouTube now, which is much harder. And I hate being on camera uh, in many ways. Uh, <laughs> um, and then podcasting, I've been doing live videos. I started a political podcast. Can you believe that? Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's uh, no controversy in that. <laughs> there's no controversy. It's called the final American political broadcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no controversy whatsoever. Yeah. So I, um, I don't know. I just, I feel like I'm at actually a weird point in content because I haven't, I've been a little bit unfocused, but the, the idea was, and I'd be curious to hear your answer in return. Like my idea was other people's content changed my life and they didn't ask me for anything for it. And so I felt a deep responsibility to do that same thing for the next person. Yeah, I would agree. I, I don't know that I felt like I owed it to anybody, but I just, I kind of just tried it on a whim as part of a partnership thing. I was trying to form a business with a few people and somebody said, Hey, we're supposed to do blog content. So get on that. And I tried it for the first time and I made a video to go along with it and it took a ton of work. And it came out, you know, the other two business partners were both like, whoa, that was like really good. And I enjoyed the process. And it was like, you know, maybe there's something here. I never foresaw myself blogging when I saw how I could fit into that world and how I could have a voice that was worth listening to, which frankly, like everybody does. It's just that most people choose not to do it. But I just kind of found myself there and really enjoyed it. And it was really cool, especially when I started seeing people like, reply and say, man, this was awesome. Like, thank you so much. It was just like validation. So I don't know. I just, uh, I think it's kind of an enjoyment thing for me, something that, and I, I never thought that would happen, but once I did, it was like, let's keep at this. This is cool. I can't tell you how 
powerful it is to get those testimonials or those like emails that people will send you. Like I went around recently to even like coaching students that I worked with a long time ago and hadn't heard anything. I had no idea what they were up to and just kind of generally was like, Hey, would you mind doing a testimonial video? It's kind of like a generic email. Right. And a guy reached out to me and he's like, I remember him telling me that his first year he made 30,000. And then he's like, I ramped up last year and I'm part time in the land business. And I made over six figures after expenses. And like, when you read something like that, you're like, wait a second. I walked him through that process, six figures part time. Like that's huge for a lot of people. So I feel like that's for me, the, the appeal to content is that impact level thing. Like there's more money, I think, to be made if you just did nothing but like honed in on investing. But I think there's a lot of impact or fulfillment that you can find in just helping people get success and results. And it's very mm-hmm. rewarding. Yeah. I know people have taken my content, learned from me, and then done way more than I ever could. Oh, for sure. That's like my story too. I get a little jealous and then I'm like, hey, I'm, you know, I just tell them, I'm like, you owe me forever. Thank you very much. You know, I'm taking, <laughs> taking credit. But, um, but Seth, you know, what's interesting is I didn't, you know, we've talked to each other a bunch of times, but I've never really talked to you in this capacity on podcasting. You have a podcasting voice like oh, through and nice. through. I a thousand percent agree with you. Yeah. yeah you sound like you've been in radio for, <laughs> for really? a lifetime. That's crazy. Like you just, yeah. You just sound so cool on podcasting. It's really, you need to lean into I that. I appreciate that. Many a podcast, many an evening where I've been very jealous of Seth's voice. I'm like, my God, like it's just so soothing and yet very articulate. He's somehow figured out how to minimize ums really well. Like when you break down his style, it's he's really, really good at what he does. Really good. Wow, yeah, man. agreed. I'm starting to blush over here. I've been working on this. I've never really talked about it here, but I created this uh, podcast with kids stories called the Storyland Podcast. And in this process... It's actually taught me a lot about like enunciation and even like creating character voices, like accents or like uh, nasally voices. And I just kind of make them up on the spot. But I, and I can even go beyond that. And once it's recorded, use this pitch shifter thing to make the voice sound lower or higher. And when it comes out, it literally sounds like some other person is talking. It's really cool. But I think through that, it's kind of helped me to like figure out how to do this voice thing. So that's cool that. You think that, Alex and Jaren? Thanks for the compliment. You're great. I noticed it as soon as we got on the, on the chat, actually. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. At the end of a lot of these conversations, we ask three final questions of our guests. And I'm actually really curious to hear Alex's responses to these because I feel like you never know what's going to come out. And I, <laughs> I'm just curious to hear what you're going to say. Do not to predict thing. me, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so... Question number one, Alex, what is your greatest fear? Oh, I hate this question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not living up to my potential. Got to answer. Not living up to my potential. Oh, that's hmm. it? Okay. How do you know if you haven't done that? Like, how do you measure that? Oh, I'm going to, I'll die with that fear. <laughs> yeah. There's no cure. I, I suffer from it daily. I think inevitably everybody will suffer that fate of that. Cause like we all have potential that's unfulfilled. Yeah. Some people don't care about it. I literally had this conversation with my wife two days ago and I said, doesn't it bother you that you have untapped greatness that you can like get into if you just were to get after it or like have something shift in your brain? And she's like, no, I'm good. I don't think that way. I just want to make money. (laughs) My girlfriend is totally at peace with who she is and she would, she's incredibly confident in a way that I just don't even, I can't understand. And she'd be like, I'm fine. I'm great the way I am. I'm fine. I'm going to go through life and do great things and I don't have to worry about it. (laughs) that's what she would say but me no actually you know what it's probably i if i really analyze what i said my fear of my untapped potential is probably if you really really got down to it is ego that's probably an ego problem interesting my wife pointed out this i don't know if it was a bumper sticker or what it was years ago but it said an enjoyable life is a wasted life which basically means like to waste your time like watching tv or just like whatever you want to do, like that's what a lot of people find enjoyable. It's not working so hard. And I can see how some people have that mindset, maybe because they've never found work that they really love. And if they did, they wouldn't think that way. But uh, some people do think that way. Like, it's just, I don't really want to do or deliver anything. I just want to hang out and eat chips all day. And that's what they find enjoyable. So different mindsets, I guess. I don't think about it in terms of like a money thing, like my potential. I honestly, I think most of my potential is in I want to write a book. 
a, like a philosophical type book and creativity. I think I'm a creative person that hasn't really tapped into it. So for me, it's not a success thing, but there's a lot of potential in a lot of different areas that I just wish I could spend all day doing cameras and writing my thoughts out, but there's other stuff to be done. So it's like, I know I'm not going to get it all done. And I would push back on what you said, Seth, because I don't know if I really thoroughly love what I do a lot of the time. Like I wouldn't say that I love the land business. Like when I have six hours of calls with motivated sellers or whatever, but like what drives my push towards untapping my potential financially, creatively, spiritually, and otherwise. There's got to be something you love about the outcome though, right? It's not like the whole thing just is terrible. I like making money, you know, like that's, and it's a, it's a predictable way to make money, but I don't know. I think some people, I just have a drive in them to like Rocky Balboa says, I want to see what's up like in Rocky five or Rocky six when he's an old guy, he's like saying, I just want to see what's left in the basement. I got something left in the basement. I just got to do something. And I think I'm going to be like, I think I'm going to be like an old man. That's like, you know what? I'm going to become a boxer when I'm like 80 or something, you know? And like, I just going to continue to go after challenging things that make me grow because I'm obsessed with it. I just want to see how far I can go. Alex, what's something that you're most proud of? These are hard questions. You know what? I have been doing photography for a little while and I found that I have a gift, not super in my technical side of photography, but I can get together with somebody who's insecure about the way they look or the way they're going to look on camera more specifically, not necessarily that they walk around insecure, but they're like, I don't like the way I look in photos. And I can take that person and I can give them confidence in a way that they don't get to feel that often or ever. So I took pictures of this young lady the other day, a good friend of mine, and you know, she didn't want to do it that much. And some of my best work and you know, now she feels great about herself. And I like that I can do that. It's it's not profitable and it's only one person, but I like that I can give people confidence like that. That's a something that I don't think that many people have the approach to do. I can only do it with the camera really, but that's something I really like being able to do. And it's something that took me a long time in my life to figure out that I have that gift, but I can really take somebody, even sometimes a stranger and like, let's go shoot for two hours uh, downtown with just you, me and a, and a camera and a flash. And I'll make you look unbelievable very little Photoshop, right? No, no, no faking. Just let's go. I'll make you confident and it'll show up on camera. Promise. Check out Alex's Instagram. He's got some great shots. He's not kidding. He's really good at it. Yeah. A close second would be, I'm proud that I've been able to consistently pay people that trust me with their money. I don't get my ego driven by money that much. I just don't care. But when I write out checks, I'm like, I paid out 30 grand this month to people who trusted me. That number is going to become a million. That's my goal. One of my financial goals is to be able to pay out a million dollars in cash flows to investors. So I'm really proud about that. It's not much yet, but it's going to grow. I'm, really, I'm excited about that. And that whole million is going to come to me. Nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, baby. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend for a moment, Alex, that you just got $100 million wired to your bank account. You're not allowed to stay on your current career path. You can't do real estate anymore, but you can do anything else you want for the rest of your life. You can't do photography either, for that matter. So nothing can stay the same. What are you going to do if money is not an issue, if that's not what's motivating you in any way? Uh, I get into politics. Wow, that would be interesting. I study a lot of history, a lot of macroeconomics, a lot of political history. And I feel like if I can't do photography, right? I can't do real estate. I think that's where I would have the most influence. I'd read a book. I definitely travel. I'm a travelholic. But, you know, there's what, 215 countries? It's like $100 million. I can hit 215 countries. Then what? Where would you travel? Uh, I got a long list. I'm going to Iceland in a few weeks. Cool. I've always wanted to go there. Sweet. I'm going to Iceland in a few weeks for a, a mastermind. I'm going to Spain in May for a, a religious pilgrimage called the Camino de Santiago. That's like 11 days. We're doing that. Uh, going to Germany right after that to go shoot a friend's wedding. And then in the end of the year, we do a, every year we do a little quick trip to South, somewhere in South America. It's different every year. I don't know where it's going to be this year. Last year we went to Belize and I'll go with some friends there. So that's four international trips this year. I'm, I don't know where a hundred million dollars. I'd go to a lot of places. I'd go to, I'd like to go to West Africa. I'd like to go to South Africa. I'd like to go to um, Israel. I'd like to go to, um, there's this world war two trip that I've been planning for like four years. Awesome, man. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, but I don't have the money. So it's all theoretical. <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> you will though. Yeah. yeah. People want to find out more about you, connect with you, throw all of their money at you. What's the best way to do that? Broke is a choice.com. Broke is a choice.com. 
It certainly is. What a name for a website. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that one, you know, you asked me like earlier, but it's like, how do you go about the world and just like confidently do this thing? I'm like, there's sometimes I say that name, that website to people and I cringe because there's people with real money and they're like, I've never been broke. Why? That does not apply to me. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I remember back when I started RE Tipster. I cannot tell you how many people think it's R-E-I tipster instead of R-E tipster or they like. R-E tipster. That's really yeah. annoying too. I mean, if I could, knowing what I know now, if I could go back and change the name, I don't, I don't know what I would change it to, but probably not what it is because so many people mess it up. So. I've been wanting to change the name of my website for two years and I just don't know what to do it to. So it just stays. I like it though, man. I really do. If you uh, end up abandoning it, let me know. I might buy it from you. I'll let you know. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Alex, for coming on the show. Appreciate uh, talking to you more in long form like this. I feel like we've sort of like said a few words here and there over the years, but it's nice to actually have like a real extended conversation. So appreciate you taking the time. And I'm incredibly grateful. You guys are amazing. I, we, like I said, we've been friends, acquaintances for a few years. So I'm very, very grateful. I appreciate you guys. Thanks again, Alex. Wish you all the best and uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.